It was a little more than a year ago, in the very early days of the pandemic shutdown. A minister friend of mine, the Reverend Jordan Nelson Long, shared a thought that reoriented my view of ministry and what lay ahead. She said that our job in March 2020 was to survive, to help others we are connected to survive, and to help liberal institutions survive. To survive, stay alive, and help others to stay alive. Until that point, I had mostly thought of Unitarian Universalist congregations as a place you go to after your basic survival needs are met. I knew that countless people had found it life-saving to walk into our doors and be greeted with acceptance and reason and love. But what Reverend Jordan was saying was a different level, and I knew immediately what she meant. In those early days and going forward, the choices we would be making about gathering, the relationships that we would be maintaining, and the advocacy would be, we would be taking part in, all these things had a life and death dimension. Closing the doors of our building would save lives. Reaching out to the isolated would save lives. Speaking up for mask wearing and supporting leaders who took the pandemic seriously would save lives. I never expected to be a minister under an authoritarian president. I never expected to be a minister during a pandemic. And I never expected to be a TV preacher focused on salvation, even the simple earthly kind of saving. But here we were. This was the abrupt new chapter that all of us found ourselves in. And it came with all kinds of new roles, chosen and unchosen. And so many of us were focused on staying alive and helping others do so. The pandemic chapter of our the pandemic chapter of our shared existence had a pretty clear-cut beginning. But a book reviewer might say that the ending of this chapter is a bit of a mess and could use an editor. Or perhaps it has too many editors, pulling the story in too many directions, with the CDC, the governor, other politicians, health officials, individual desires, and various troublemakers all of them wielding red pens and tugging at the plot line in ways that suit them, with some even declaring the chapter over. We are definitely in a disorienting space, nationally, congregationally, and perhaps personally, of overlapping endings and beginnings of the pause button and the resume button being pressed at the same time. This past week got me thinking about a party I once went to for a friend who had just run the Twin Cities Marathon for the first time. The race had taken place in the morning and the party was in the afternoon. All of the guests were so proud and excited for our friend and her accomplishment. For us, the marathon was over and our friend was in good spirits and she was grateful to be done. But her tired smile and her minimal movements and her relatively few words hinted that for her body, the marathon's effects were not over. And in fact, they were not, not that day or even the next day. Sometimes when you go, some, go through something challenging and the, challenge, and the challenge ends, there's a temptation to view whatever it was as instantly over. But a, lot, but a lot of times, like after a marathon, or like right now in the ebbing of the pandemic, the ending of the chapter is not a clean break from what just happened. The effects linger. As hopeful and grateful as some of us might be right now, we might also be worn out, or rusty and out of practice, or grieving, or not quite willing to trust that the storyline will continue in a positive direction. But as humanists, we know that any positive direction depends on human beings, on us. Like many of you, I see little evidence that our stories are written in the stars or by an invisible author beyond the sky so much of our story is ours to write. And while the larger sweep of history can sometimes feel overwhelming, we do have a lot of say in our little corner of the world, and we have learned much that, that we can take with us in this next year. For one thing, we in this congregation learned that the phrase, we got this, applies to us. This was not the first time we've had to adapt. We've had changes in ministries and staff, and the major disruption that comes with a building project. But this past year required us to rise up to a whole new level of can-do. 
With technology as new as streaming video and as old as paper greeting cards, we kept most of our, fo most of our folks stitched together and we made changes quickly and continually. We can't see too far into the future, but we know our next chapter will include many platforms, in-person, streamed audio and video, and even those paper greeting cards. Because we've learned that we use many ways to magnify our impact, and because our community has grown beyond the old boundaries of geography. And as a congregation based in Minneapolis, we have had a front row seat for much difficult learning about systemic racism and policing, about equity and inclusion, about fear and trauma and hope. We have seen the power of human beings in the streets and at the ballot box to turn around politicians and policies. And all of these lessons will inform our next chapter, both within the congregation and how the congregation shows up in the world. There is great eagerness for us to get back together in person as a community. And when we do, we will bring all these lessons and experiences with us. Some things will be the same, old connections restored, and the critical thinking and humor that have long been hallmarks of our congregation will be there in abundance. But we know we have been changed by these times we have been through. And so in this somewhat messy turning of a page, in this first draft of a new chapter, may we be open to the new ways that await. Today at our annual meeting, our congregation will either affirm the eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism, or we will not. Either outcome will give us important information about how this congregation moves forward into our next chapter in the coming program year and years. If we affirm the eighth principle, adding language to our covenant to hold ourselves accountable in building a diverse, beloved community by our actions to dismantle racism and other oppressions. If we affirm this, we will set ourselves on the pathway of work that in some ways is not yet known and for which we have ample resources. We don't have to make it up all out of whole cloth ourselves. We join a great number of other congregations who are doing this work. The FUS Moving Toward Equity team will meet in June to set priorities as we move into the new program year, and we'll continue to discuss what it means to be accountable, how we as an institution hold ourselves to right relationship both within and beyond our walls, with ourselves and who we are in the community. A vote to affirm the eighth principle is not the end of the work. In some ways, it is a new beginning. And what if we do not affirm the eighth principle today? Well, that gives us some important information about the work we have yet to do in learning about anti-racism and other oppressions, about the depths we need to plumb to fully live into our promise as humanist free thinkers who are working to make the changes we need for a more just and equitable world. A vote against affirming the eighth principle is not the end of the work. It will mean that we have more work to do to get to this baseline. Moving toward equity team member Sue Blackwell and I were on a call this week with a panel of national Unitarian Universalist leaders discussing covenant. You've heard me say that one of the things that makes Unitarian Universalism and uh, the way we practice congregational humanism, somewhat distinct, though not unique, is that we are covenantal rather than creedal. We don't say a creed each time we gather, we believe so and so and so and so. We say a covenant. This is how we will be together. Two things stood out to Sue and me as we discussed it later. The Reverend Meredith Garman said that each generation 
gets to look at covenant anew and decide what it means to be together, what values we hold most dear and are willing to fight for, what kind of world we want to build together. The last time that all of the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism were um, explored as our covenant, we covenant to affirm and promote, was in 1987. So a whole new two generations probably uh, are, are ready to look at these anew. The Reverend Dr. Bill Sinkford, past president of the UUA, called us to recognize how individualism is central to our practice of progressive religion. He calls us to move in the direction of being more accountable to the larger community, who, who we are and how we work in accountable relationship with other community members. This distinction between how our Humanism may give us individual, intellectual stimulation versus how we may humbly join with folks working from, for the common good from beyond our walls is compelling to me, and I hope it is to you. This idea of individualism versus how we operate in community and what is the value we bring and what can we learn and support in community it requires a great deal of humility. We know the huge challenges to all kinds of work at the society this year. Jim, I love the way that you framed this up for us, a messy story. And yet our justice teams have been resilient and robust in this age of meeting online. Our active voices team transitioned seamlessly to giving us a new ways to connect on important issues. And as we join in person again, I have no doubt that they will transition again. We have a new team that is joining the Align Minneapolis Coalition to accountably support people with lived experience of homelessness. Our climate justice team has not let the pandemic slow them down. We've been meeting and producing content. And members of the climate justice team and I will be headed up to the treaty people gathering to protest line three in early June. We invite you to join us. As you've seen, our Moving Toward Equity team is focused on accountability within and beyond FUS. And our participation in the Unrestrict Minnesota campaign and the Reproductive Freedom lawsuit will be even more important as reproductive freedom is seriously threatened on the national level. There's so much work for us to do. You've been doing it. We've been doing it. And it's so easy to be discouraged at the enormity of injustice in our world. And yet we know when we work together, we give each other hope and inspiration. We bring our struggles to the table. Our joys are multiplied and our burdens are lessened as we do work in community, in community within and beyond our walls. So come back. Keep coming back, ready to renew our commitment to a just world and our covenant and ways of being together. May we be open to new ways of justice and welcome. Thanks, Kelly. The story that uh, First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis tells and has told uh, in its 140 years plus of existence is the story of one of America's greatest ideas. I think that's transcendentalism. Now, how is it that an explicitly humanist Midwestern congregation has carried a 19th century East Coast religio-philosophical movement into the 21st century? Well, that's the story, I think. Now, just to refresh your mind, the Oxford Dictionary defines trans transcendentalism a couple of different ways. One, an idealistic philosophical and social movement which developed in New England around 1836 in reaction to rationalism 
influenced by Romanticism, Platonism, and Kantian philosophy. It taught that divinity pervades all nature and humanity, and its members held progressive views on feminism and communal living. Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau were central figures. That's definition one. And, mm, well, we don't really even agree with most of that anymore. Well, here's number two, a, a, a system developed by Immanuel Kant based on the idea that in order to understand the nature of reality, one must first examine and analyze the reasoning process which governs the nature of experience. Well, that's complicated. But as you know, uh, Emily Dickinson is uh, my go-to poet when I need some inspiration, and no poet is as precise and concise, I think, as Emily Dickinson in either her thought or her language. She's a whole lot better than the Oxford Dictionary sometimes. And her poem, numbered number 236, well summarizes transcendentalism, I think, even though she herself was never part of that movement. And that's one of the points that I do want to make today. First Unitarian Society is one of the keepers of the transcendentalist spirit because we are way more radical than those 19th century radicals, and we're way more radical in our thinking than most Unitarian Universalists and liberal church folks are today. Well, the uh, poem goes like this. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home. With a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome, some keep the Sabbath in surplice. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. Now, Emily was an introvert, uh, admittedly, and uh, even more of an introvert than I am, actually which uh, is saying quite a bit. But as the weeks turned to months this past year and our society's building stayed shut, I couldn't help thinking of this poem and how Emily phrases that. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home. We humanists don't go to church out of any sort of obligation. We don't go to church uh, to please a God out there. We go because, well, mm, no, we don't want to get it ha to heaven at last, do we? We want to be getting there all along. That's transcendentalism. During these pandemic months, I've heard a lot of horror stories from my fellow ministers of various traditions. And I have to admit that when I hear the horror stories uh, from the pandemic and how churches have been dealing with these things, I don't have any horror stories. And that's because you, the people of First Unitarian Society, are unique. Uh, you're self-selected, you're unique, and you're amazing human beings, if I may say so. You're inheritors of the transcendentalist spirit. You don't need anyone, especially an old guy like me, telling you how to live or move or have your being. That's not why you're part of the society. It's something else. It's about responsibility. You, like Emily Dickinson, prefer to hear a bird's song to that pealing of a church bell. We humanists, and I think Dickinson fits into this category as well, we humanists aren't worried about how to be more holy or even how to be more fully human. We know that all human beings are already holy and already fully human. Rather, we explore ways to find meaning, purpose, and fulfillment in being that human. We don't need to dress in what Emily calls surplice, all those church vestments and fancy hats and such, because we know that we wear our wings. Rather than searching for salvation, we are looking for ways to live and to love more fully right now. We look for beauty and truth, not in some far off ethereal realm, but right here, 
right now. As Dickinson puts it, God preaches a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. We can hear nature speaking, and those words are not boring, not pressing us into a world we can't inhabit or understand. What Americans don't think we have these days, you know, is time. Uh, We think we don't have time to reflect. Uh, We don't have time for, oh, even remorse or thinking about forgiveness. We don't have any time to change our minds. We don't have any time to study the past or see how we might improve our future. What we Americans destroy in our mad pursuit of time what we justify in terms of our cruelty and waste in our mad pursuit of time, these losses are our failure as a people and as individuals who justify our cruelty and waste and haste because everyone else is doing this. This is the great call of the transcendentalist tradition. Slow down. Actually, you do have time. Slow down, listen, take responsibility, personal responsibility. As Dickinson phrased it, so instead of getting to heaven at last, we're going all along. That's quite a story that we're telling here at First Unitarian Society, quite a story that each of you is living, taking the time to think and to be It's the essence of whatever it is that progressive American religion has been about for all of these years. And we go on telling it, expanding it, living it. That is your story at First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis.